Hey, what's up guys? Quinn Hennick here, doctor of physical therapy, sports med at Juggernaut Training Systems and founder of Clinical Athlete. We're gonna talk about overhead squat screening, mobility, movement, prep, and then get into a little bit of the performance side. But the overhead squat is kind of like everyone's unicorn in the weightlifting world, right? It's, it's that prerequisite to uh, the, the snatch. Everybody on Instagram wants their overhead squat to look really good, almost more so than what, uh, how much weight is on the bar. And so we're gonna talk about how to optimize positioning, comfort level, stability in the overhead squat. It hopefully has some carryover to improvements in your lifts, specifically for the snatch. And so coach and overhead squat extraordinaire, Liz Messina, is going to demonstrate an overhead squat. So I'll have, you know, if it's an athlete that I've never worked with before, if they have some experience with squatting, I'll just say, put your feet where you typically would squat. Uh, if they've never squatted in their entire life, we'll just put them outside of shoulder width. A little bit of toe out is okay. I'm completely fine with that because I want to see what their strategy is. Then I will place the bar where I want it, which is right over the upper back. Now, as far as grip width, this kind of depends on whether you are an actual, uh, you know, you compete in the sport of weightlifting or you're just using the overhead squat as kind of a, a general training tool. But I'd bring the bar down for a second and put it in the, in the crease of your hip. In general, we're looking at the bar to rest in the crease of the hip and that's called the power position. And so that's just a general rule of thumb as far as where we start people in their grip. So put that bar over your head and then I'll place it right over the upper back is where I want that bar to stay. And my cues are very simple. Keep your feet flat, keep your elbows locked out, and squat down as deep as you can. Good. And then come on back up and then squat again. So if I had never met Liz before and she showed me this overhead squat, I would be pretty happy. I would probably say, well, our screen is done. Let's just start training. But sometimes what you'll see is as the lifter squats down, go down slow, maybe the bar starts to drift forward, right? She wouldn't be able to support any load like that. Maybe she's unable to attain a depth that she desires or me as a coach desires. If you can receive the bar lower, you can potentially lift more weight. And so that's why we would like to maximize the depth, at least uh, to their comfort in the squat. Maybe you see some type of, of shifting side to side or, or something like that. And so you don't know what's tight, uh, quote unquote, dysfunctional, if that's even a word, or you don't know what's an issue. All you know is that they're, the athlete's not passing the overhead squat screen to your standards. And so we do something to give them a little slack in the system. And what we can do is elevate the heels. Now, obviously a weightlifting shoe will allow this, but you can also use a PVC pipe, which has a little bit more of a heel lift. So this does a couple things. The most common thought is that it takes ankle mobility out of the equation. And so essentially it puts your ankles into a plantar flex position and it gives you a surplus of ankle range of motion. You're able to shift your knees forward pretty much an unlimited amount when you have that, that, uh, that heel lift. And so it takes any, any ankle mobility restriction out of the equation, but it also shifts your center of gravity forward. It's a counterbalance. And that's even for athletes who possess adequate ankle mobility, which is, in my experience, uh, much more than who typically think they have ankle restrictions. Everybody wants to blame their ankles for their lack of depth in a squat. But when we screen the ankles, we find that they have plenty of range, but they still benefit from a heel lift. And so they're benefiting from that counterbalance. So go ahead and squat down. Let's say Liz was struggling with her depth. And then when you elevate the heels, you see something like that. Well, you've now cleared the hips of mobility restriction. And we can start training right here. So go down again, we can take this into a tempo overhead squat where she goes down very, very slowly. She works on controlling her trunk, even a five second descent. We can have her pause in certain uh, ranges. So hold there, go down a little slower, hold, hold. So, you know, three count pauses or three position pauses in the overhead squat, come back down. So as soon as the athlete reaches your standard of movement. They can achieve the depth. They can keep the bar where you placed it. You can start training that position, incorporate tempos, pauses, etc. So then we can take that 
into a screen for the ankle. So we've cleared the hips potentially. The shoulder I find is not necessarily a limiting factor in the, in the overhead squat, the same that it would be in a jerk or an overhead press because the hands are wider. And so it allows you a little bit more wiggle room as far as the shoulder joint is concerned. But the ankles, potentially, we at least want the ability to use our ankles when we squat. And so we can take that into a half kneeling test. And so if Liz, uh, Liz gets on one knee here, facing the wall, so the test is simply closed chain ankle dorsiflexion. This half kneeling position, rocking the knee forward, is testing the ankle's ability to dorsiflex. And there's been some studies that have uh, shown some decent reliability, meaning when more than one provider or clinician or coach is testing this movement, they can recreate it decently well. The literature has told us that anywhere from three to five inches away from the wall is adequate ankle dorsiflexion for most daily activities. And I would argue too, with a weightlifting shoe that allows you an elevated heel, uh, three inches away from the walls is adequate ankle mobility for a deep squat. So start scooting back to the wall, or from the wall, Liz, and, and just find the spot where you can barely touch your knee to the wall. Good. And so she's in that three or four inch range, but let's say you have an athlete who's way up here and they, boom, boom, they hit that block, okay? And then they showed you in their flat-footed, barefoot overhead squat that they were unable to achieve depth. Maybe ankle range of motion is something we can address, but we're probably gonna still do it with tempos and pauses uh, and, and things like that. And we can mobilize and stretch intermittently in between. But this is a screen, so you've looked at their overhead squat, uh, you've, you've kind of assessed ankle, and now we can look at hips. So get into quadruped for me, Liz. So in this position, we're mimicking the torso angle of a squat, and then just rock back. So we're monitoring, good, flat here. Any problem, pinch or discomfort in the hips or anything like that, bring your, bring your elbows uh, up underneath your shoulders. Good, and so we're clearing essentially clearing hip range of motion, rock back and forth like that. There's really no change. And so it, the idea being, if you have an athlete who's overhead squatting and they show you that they're struggling to achieve depth, what you can do is stick them in this quadruped positioning, at least get them used to starting, starting to uh, experiment with that hip flexion position. It can also show you that maybe their hips move just fine and they're just not strong enough to hold their body against gravity and we'd have to incorporate uh, slower tempos and pauses, elevate their heels to give them some slack. Uh, all of those things are very helpful. At this point, we can start building the overhead squat from the ground up. And notice, uh, or keep in mind this, I'm gonna ex uh, explain the prep for the overhead squat in a bottoms up fashion, meaning we're gonna start with very low level exercises and build up to standing. In reality, in the, in the clinical or real world gym setting, go top down. If you can assess and fix somebody's overhead squat to your standards on their feet, then do that. There's no need for any of these lower level exercises if you don't need them. But just for context, I'm gonna show you how we would uh, build from the ground up. So go ahead and lay on your back, Liz, and put your feet up on the wall here. And so we're in this kind of supine squatting position for somebody who's very, very, very new to, to squatting, to training in general. This is a very stable position, obviously, you're laying on your back, but at least gets them into that hip flexion position because she can even scoot a little closer to the wall and get into a deeper hip flexion position. And now, from here, what we can do is use a PVC, go into your snatch grip, up to the ceiling, <clears throat> breathe in for me, exhale all the way, exhale hard, get your abs on, and then start to drive back. And so she's in the snatch grip, she's integrating that overhead position while in a squatting position with her hips. So bring, come back up. And we can load this by sliding a little plate on the end, and we showed you this with the mobility uh, myths video for static stretching. And so if you haven't watched that, check that out too. But this is a nice start to integrate because if you look, it looks similar to an overhead squat. We can do that unilaterally as well. So I'll take this and we can load up with a plate and she can just go into this kind of Y pattern 
because essentially we load our mobility as soon as we possibly can. Come back up, lock that elbow out. Good. Come back up and then lay on your right side. We talk about shoulder position for the overhead squat and, and for that supine drill, you know, sets of uh, five, six, seven reps, but they're all very, very controlled. So don't get too hung up with the numbers. Two or three sets, slow controlled reps, your, your brace, you're stable through the trunk and you're stabilizing movement overhead. The sideline position is a nice teaching tool to show somebody where I want them to stack their shoulder when they're in that snatch grip. So I'm going to have Liz push the front of that shoulder forward. So I see that a lot in this overhead position. We're going to talk a lot about this when we get to standing, but the shoulder position, this is not necessarily a stacked stable position. The golf ball is kind of offset on the tee. And so I'll literally tap on the shoulder. I'll say, put that away. It's not this exaggerated down and back position. It's just kind of mid range. And that's where we can load up because pop that shoulder forward again. Where if I were to say, Hey, let me put this 50 pound kettlebell in your hand. Would that feel pretty stable? Would that feel comfortable? Probably not. She'd probably freak out. Right? So put that away. She can experiment with a little screwdriver action or just hold this position. It's just a quick little teaching tool to get her to stack that shoulder and I'll take that because obviously this position doesn't mimic a, a snatch grip 100%. So she can take that into an overhead position as well. And guess what? We can load it up just like we did before. So slow rep, she's keeping that shoulder stacked for the clinicians out there, for somebody who's coming back from a shoulder injury and we're trying to just reintroduce load, for the first time, this can be a nice, more gentle approach than just putting a barbell over their head right away. Good. We'll take that. We'll start building up. And again, six to eight reps, uh, two to three sets before your prep. Let's go into half kneeling now. And I like the front foot elevated half kneeling position and let's switch sides because it puts her hip into a deeper hip flexion position. She's halfway to a deep squat here on this side. And so she can integrate a little bit of, of hip mobility here while we work on the overhead position. And so we're going to go behind the neck, snatch grip, press in a front foot elevated half kneeling position. Center gravity is lower. She's got more points of ground contact three here in the front foot elevated half kneeling position. And so she's more stable. It's a nice teaching tool to get somebody again, comfortable going overhead. Who's maybe, uh, you know, feels a little bit more unstable when they're standing or something like that. And obviously we can do this with a bar and we can load this up pretty well. Push up again and hold that position. This is where I can start to talk about uh, just shoulder position in general. You know, there's talks of internal rotation uh, generally being thought to be a bad thing, external rotation thought to be a good thing. Uh, but in reality, what we're looking for is somewhere in the middle. Yeah, I can see that internal rotation is probably unstable, but there's a lot more going on than just humeral internal rotation. This exaggerated external rotation is also not necessarily sustainable. And so what we're looking for is a middle ground where she can just reach up on that bar. Uh, think about your, the tops of your shoulder blades pinching together and kind of creating a solid platform. The bar should rest on your upper back. From here, we can even do split squats from the snatch grip while she's holding that stable overhead position. And obviously we can switch sides there, but you see and relax for a second. We're just kind of building the position from the ground up. Let's go to both feet, lose the PVC. So goblet squat, she can transition the bell to one hand 
and then we can work a half Y, or kind of moving in the scapular plane here. The bell provides a nice counterbalance. This is also where we can start to integrate the ankle range of motion. Go ahead and stand up. So what you'll see a lot is as the athlete squats down, we'll go super slow here, somewhere right about here maybe, for example, you'll start to see those ankles or those tibias start to shoot backwards, right? Butt goes back, chest dives forward, and they say, ah, shoot, I have tight ankles. And maybe that's the case, but your ankles are not going, the ankle mobility is not going to improve unless you put focus work in that position. So start your descent, ankles start to travel forward. Let's say this is right here, where you start to feel like your ankles get shot back or your, your tibia gets shot back. You need to pause here, actively try to recruit the muscles of your shin and keep driving into dorsiflexion. You should feel the front of your shins burning in that respect. The bell will help you. That's why we have that counterbalance so that you can keep that weight forward. Stand back up. If you need extra counterbalance, and again, I realize that you could just put your weightlifting shoes on and that's absolutely uh, added benefit. You can also put plates underneath your weightlifting shoes and don't be afraid to do that. But so we've got PVC here as counterbalance. We've got counterbalance with goblet squat. Go ahead and squat down. This should be plenty of slack in the system to allow you to start to work into these positions. Go ahead and stand up and give me another rep there. What you can do then is start to decrease the need for the heel lift. Over time, as these positions become easier, you don't need as high a heel lift. And the great thing about change plates is the, the widths or the heights are incremental. And so you've got those white kilo plates those five that are a little wider, all the way down to the point fives that are super thin. So use those to your advantage. Go ahead and lose the kettlebell. Heels. So now we're starting to become more specific to the overhead squat. Go ahead and squat down for me. And grab this guy. We've established, we've worked the hips. We've established shoulder position. We want that to be nice and active. Now we're gonna to start to teach the actual overhead squat. The way that I coach it, if I'm looking at the athlete from the front and all I can see is the belly button up, I shouldn't know whether they're squatting or standing. It should look exactly the same. What we see a lot is in the standing position, the overhead, uh, the shoulders, the elbows are nice and locked out. When they're in the bottom of a squat, all of a sudden that changes and you see the bar position is different, the shoulder position is different, it should look the same from top to bottom. So that's my cue. If it doesn't, I'm giving the athlete some slack in the system. In this case, it's a, it's a heel lift that's a little bit bigger than a weightlifting shoe until we can achieve that. So watch Liz's shoulder position, watch the bar position. It should look exactly the same all the way down as she squats. Come back up, good. And if it doesn't, if it breaks down, somewhere in the middle, somewhere towards the end. Don't abandon the overhead squat. Don't say, oh, I need to do an hour of mobility drills now. I need to do all these corrective exercises. Maybe you just need to spend more time here. Maybe you need a, a higher heel lift. Widen your hands out just a touch. Give yourself some slack in the system, but don't abandon the actual movement. You have to, you have to do the movement to get better at that. And so we work tempos a lot and pauses in this position. Go ahead and squat down again for me. Good, nothing changes. Bring the bar back down to your back. Remember we did that half kneeling, front foot elevated, half kneeling over, uh, behind the neck press. Well now we'll do a behind the neck press in a bilateral squat with a pretty generous heel lift until they don't need as much heel lift. And it's about as simple as that. Feeling all right? Good. Those are several tools for the overhead squat. Don't think if you can't barefoot overhead squat or not to your standard or the coach's standard that you need to abandon the movement altogether. Try to approach this from the top down and give yourself some slack and work the positions. Now that we've established the overhead squat position, we have to start to integrate a little bit of load and speed and timing for it to be more specific to the snatch. It's very common for an athlete to be very, very strong 
in the overhead squat and for all that to kind of go to hell when they try to snatch. And that's because the snatch incorporates a timing and a speed element. So we have to start to bridge that gap a little bit. A second very, very important point is that if you possess the positions for a light overhead squat, but when the weight gets heavier, all of a sudden you feel tighter or you don't attain the same positions. It has nothing to do with your mobility. If you have the mobility for lighter loads, then you have the mobility for heavier loads. You just don't possess the strength or the control and it's much different. The same conversation could be said when somebody's overhead squat looks very, very good. It meets the athlete's standards, meets the coach's standards, but yet their snatch receiving position does not look the same. Now we're talking technical breakdowns, etc. But it's not because you don't have mobility for the snatch and you've got mobility for the overhead squat. It doesn't work like that. You've got the requisite mobility. Now you're putting together the timing. Some of the drills that we use to integrate that timing are snatch balance progressions. Now we also use a snatch balance to strengthen the shoulders, but to give athletes confidence punching into the hole, to give them timing receiving the bar over their head with footwork. So I'll show you, I'll run you through a progression here with Liz. The heaving snatch balance will incorporate a dip and drive, kind of like a jerk, with the athlete in her squatting position. So her feet are not going to move. It's a nice place to start because moving the feet and punching under the bar, uh, it's a lot to think about for a newer lifter. So if they have the overhead squat prerequisites, we'll give them a little dip and drive and we add a speed element, the heaving snatch balance. So dip, drive, punch, good. And you see Liz's feet don't move, but she dips, drives. Now as it gets heavier, she'll have to get faster and faster. You still wanna finish your upward drive, but you wanna punch under the bar. Dip, drive, punch, good. And the idea is not necessarily creating max height on the bar, but it's punching your body underneath. Dip, drive, punch, good. Come back up. Now we'll take that into a standard snatch balance. Everything is the same from the dip, drive, and punch standpoint, but now we're gonna start with the feet in the pulling stance. So Liz is gonna have to move her feet into her receiving position as she punches under the bar. It adds another layer, but it's more specific to the snatch because we obviously generally move our feet to receive the bar in the snatch. Timing wise, we want the feet and the elbows to land simultaneously. So as the elbows lock out, the feet have acquired their positions. So dip, drive, punch, good. Again, this is the standard snatch balance Dip, drive, punch, good. Rest for a second. All the while, the overhead squat position should look the same. So if I take snapshots of Liz's bottom position, it should look exactly the same as the heaving snatch balance. It should look exactly the same as the overhead squats that we previously did. We'll take that into a drop snatch. The drop snatch is a, a progression in this, uh, in this instance because it's faster but you will probably have to use a lighter load because there is no dip and drive component. So you don't have any momentum on the, in the upward trajectory of the bar to punch under it. It's straight down. So Liz is gonna stand tall, hips and knees are extended, and then punch under the bar. Do that again. You can start in the squat stance so it would kind of be like a heaving drop snatch, except there's no heave, but you just don't move your feet. So it's a little bit easier. Again, it takes one of the variables out of the equation. Good. But generally at this point, we're going feet and elbows. One more time. Drop snatch and punch. Good. And the overhead squat, the receiving positions look exactly the same as our previous uh, examples. And rest. Very, very good. You've acquired, you prep the overhead squat. You've acquired the positions, you've, you've worked pauses and tempos, you've spent time in those positions, you're comfortable. Now you start to integrate speed and load and progression to make it more specific to the snatch. So hopefully there are some tools there uh, to help 
the overhead squat to help everybody's white buffalo and to acquire your unicorn, which is the Instagram ready overhead squat. So I'm Quinn Hennick, doctor of physical therapy. If you're looking for a healthcare professional who understands athletes, search the directory at www.clinicalathlete.com for a provider in your area. And check out Liz's website, metastrongmovement.com uh, for real world examples of strength and conditioning with real people. Thanks guys.